Hey again, everyone, and welcome to the fourth module of our course. Today, I just have one short video for you in which we will be discussing um, some, some, I think, pretty important content uh, regarding the uh, fourth estate. And so I've titled this sort of presentation, Surveying the Fourth Estate in Search of Content. And I really want to get into what that means in just a moment. Uh, but in, in, in talking about this and in, in talking through this with you, I want to first of all think about what content actually is. And I know that there's many different definitions of content that we could think about, um, especially because we've come to associate content with online kind of uh, uh, stuff. And so I, I contrast here two potential definitions, one being content meaning the original reporting on a news event or development that leads one to learn new stuff, like gain new information about the world around them, versus a much more expansive definition of content that we might uh, take from sort of some early pioneers of the internet, the stuff in your website. We could think about content that way as well. Um, and if, you know, I think if we sort of hold to this first definition. And we say we're really looking for content in terms of stuff that's able to inform us about uh, the world around us that's sort of verifiable, that's vetted, that's credible. Um, I think it is, it's interesting to think about where and under what circumstances we can obtain that, even in a world in which content is more broadly defined as the stuff all over the place, the stuff on your website, the stuff that you might be able to consume, whatever it might be, you know, memes, uh, hot takes on issues, arguments, um, you know, celebrities making some strange statement, all the stuff that comes to us via social media. And so really the, the purpose of this week's reading and the purpose of this week's content is to think carefully about what we mean by the media environment. Of course, the media environment, I've said in previous modules and in previous um, Blackboard discussions that uh, I sort of conceive of the media inf environment or the information environment as being this kind of ocean or this body of water where there's all these different uh, creatures swimming through and interacting with one another and some are sort of eating the other ones. Um, there are new ones being hatched from little eggs all the time and coming to join this school of different fish swimming around. Um, and it's a kaleidoscope. It's a very uh, busy scene where there's so many different uh, different sources now of uh, you know big fish and small fish uh, um, you know, to so to speak, that are producing content for us. And uh, we think about the legacy media environment or media environment um, as it was sort of before uh, the internet came to be the dominant mode of communication. You know, all of these leg legacy media environment um, sort of producers are still very much active and still very important in the overall uh, environment. And so, you know, I, I think first of all about radio, which was, of course, um, earlier in the 20th century, perhaps the most important purveyor of information. You know, we think uh, about FDR's fireside chats and the, the sort of revolution of radio in bringing content to the living rooms of average Americans. Uh, we can't overstate the fact that that is still something that is frequently consumed by a lot of Americans. In fact, um, a vast majority of Americans will listen to, to at least one station on the FM or AM dial on a weekly basis. Still, you know, upwards of 90% of Americans still turn on the, the radio, um, you know, whenever they get in the car, for example. And so while many of us have our devices always plugged in, either through an aux jack or a Bluetooth uh, link to our, to our cars, uh, many, many Americans still listen to the radio all the time when they are driving. And so music, talk, NPR, all kinds of different stations uh, are, are conveying information about politics, you know, just news in general, to uh, audiences that are sitting in traffic every day. So we can't, we can't uh, overstate the importance of radio even today. Um, television, of course, is a piece of the media environment that is still perhaps the dominant form of news acquisition in America. Again, despite what you might imagine that everybody is, is consuming social media 24-7. Um, and so we think about distinguishing over-the-air television and cable television. Certainly, the, we'll talk a lot more in this class about the rollout of cable and some of its implications for politics later. Uh, but we think about, for example, our local PBS affiliates, CBS, ABC, NBC, and Fox. Uh, back in the day, they called this, you know, the big three, <laughs> the CBS, ABC, NBC sort of triumvirate. Um, that's been joined in, uh, in later years by additional entrance to that television, um, television bandwidth. But uh, these are still super important sources that we can't overlook. They provide a tremendous amount of, of content on local reporting, and they're consumed by millions of Americans on a daily basis. Many, many Americans get, get you know, use these over-the-air um, local news channels as their primary news sources uh, in the morning and in the evenings. Uh, and so we can't, again, overlook this um, piece of the legacy media environment. 
Of course, cable is an increasing, uh, increasingly popular and important segment in that uh, in that market as well, including Fox News, MSNBC, CNN. Um, I've included C-SPAN. This actually C-SPAN is the oldest uh, television uh, news news network, which of course reports primarily just on Congress, but also has other sort of politics politics uh, pieces. You'd be surprised to know that C-SPAN actually went on air in 1979, so it's incredibly old uh, as far as cable goes. Uh, it wasn't until the 80s, or the very late 80s, that CNN actually had its uh, heyday, and then now, of course, um, Fox and MSNBC and the more sort of niche partisan news outlets are becoming more um, and more important in the media environment today. And then finally, on the slide here, I've got a discussion of print media, which uh, certainly one of the big trends that we will talk about uh, in this week's discussion is the, the substantial decline in the circulation of local dailies and even national circulation newspapers, so much so that um, you'll, you'll read, hopefully, um, in, uh, in the reading for this week that Washington Post was actually bought out by Jeff Bezos, the, the uh, founder of Amazon, uh, you know, not too many years ago, partially because this, uh, this media environment makes it very hard for, for uh, print newspapers to be profitable. And so uh, we've seen this, this happening again and again. We've had layoffs and stuff at the Baltimore Sun and a dwindling of the number of reporters providing that, uh, that hard-hitting daily um, reporting that you'd expect from local dailies. Um, we also have other pieces of the print landscape, including periodicals and magazines, and importantly, actually, I would say alt-local news publications. I highlight here the City Paper, which is actually a defunct alt-weekly that came out um, in Baltimore. It was a source of a lot of commentary and news on, um, you know, town halls, uh, on, uh, you know, what's going on in City Hall, the, the mayoral uh, politics and, and all kinds of things in, uh, in city government. And so these actually do provide a tremendous amount of news. I have here also tabloids, which provide maybe not so much news, uh, usually just sensationalism and just really wacky stuff these days. Uh, but, you know, in, in the, the history of news media, these kinds of tabloids were at some point important. So all these different sources, of course, have been joined in recent years by a sort of a second layer of what we might call the new media environment. And so, of course, we have online media conglomerates. Uh, many of you will read in the, in the reading about uh, news sort of uh, operations like Vice and AOL. Huffington Post, obviously, was one that, that came in pretty strong in the early 2000s and still has a very important foothold in the, in the market. Yahoo, BuzzFeed, all kinds of different websites that are sort of designed to convey news to audiences, but are primarily on web site uh, domains. And so they, you know, Vice may have um, sort of a partnership with HBO and they might produce televised content, but they are, they conceive of themselves as being a, a primarily online media empire. These are becoming increasingly important um, and sort of bridge the gap between that legacy environment and the new media environment. Because I think what many of you are probably thinking about as the the, the pillars, the cornerstone of the social media or of the uh, new media environment is, of course, social media platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are all very, very important um, uh, platforms. But as we'll talk about in a moment, we need to maybe distinguish between these kinds of conglomerates, which hire and pay journalists to produce content, and these platforms, which are simply um, sort of fora, right? They're forums where uh, this information that comes from other places can be shared. And so this is kind of a, a, a distinct piece of the environment in that it's something wholly different than both the legacy environment and these online media conglomerates that we've been discussing. And finally, we've got crossover publishing apps. So media, well, we can talk about like blogging uh, as being an important source of news potentially today. And uh, these kind of newsletters are becoming a really important piece of that puzzle as well, like paid content. Uh, finding ways for um, you know independent journalists to get supported for you know pennies a, a week or something by by readers, uh, because at the end of the day, one really big challenge in this new media environment is the funding model. That is, how do you actually pay people to produce this content? And there are different models across these platforms. I mean, you think about a platform like YouTube, for example, where you get paid by the view essentially if you're able to have enough overall views and your channel becomes monetized. And so monetization is one way that you can get this to happen. Uh, other people, though, are relying on directing traffic to a website where they're able to run ads and, um, you know, and actually get paid that way by getting ads in front of people's faces. Uh, and then there's other, again, other 
kinds of um, kinds of, uh, of sort of uh, solutions to that problem, including, for example, paywalls, where some of the legacy media uh, have have attempted to sort of break into the online environment, but have put up paywalls to try to say, look, we're not going to let you have full access to the New York Times election coverage. You've got to pay ninety nine cents, you know, a week or something to get that access. Whereas before, you'd be paying, you know, several dozens of dollars a month or something for daily delivery of a, of a print newspaper to your house. So this is a big, a big question, a sort of perennial question of this, this uh, difference between the legacy media environment that is what we classically conceive of as being the fourth estate, right? that independent press that's critical of government and is constantly keeping an eye on things, and then this, which is sort of a, a hybrid of both journalists and just users that makes it much murkier in terms of the actual um, monetiza monetization of content. Uh, the last thing I can mention here in the new media environment is podcasting, which, of course, as you know from our discussions, we'll be working on this in, our, in this class, this very class. So we've got po podcasts that are hosted on all sorts of different platforms, including Spotify, which is trying right now really hard to become a major player in the Spotify, or excuse me, in the podcast world. Apple Podcasts, where many people get their podcasts, and a whole number of other players. But within that, of course, it's, that's just the hosting platform. We have all kinds of different individuals. We've got people who are making names for themselves on podcasting primarily. Um, you know, I think about people like the, like Joe Rogan, for example, uh, for better or worse, is creating a lot of content. Um, you know, other other um, you know podcasts with a pretty heavy right or left leans, uh, and then of course the more kind of legacy media breaking into new audio, like uh, NPR and New York Times, producing a lot of podcasts that are consumed very very um, sort of religiously, <laughs> very committedly by uh, listeners who are doing laundry or driving to work or whatever. Um, this new audio is becoming an increasingly um, important form for conveying news and for news, news uh, commentary today. So all that together, I think, really shows that we've got a really, really busy environment. We've got an extraordinarily competitive environment for anyone who's trying to become uh, a news magnate. You know, I think one of the readings mentions that as late as like 2005, you know, kind of before this really explodes, um, it was extraordinarily good business to own a media empire. And so if you were in, in, in media, you could expect to make huge profits every year because people were, were sort of extremely interested in consuming content. And, there, you know, simply there, there were ways to break into that market. And if you could provide scoops on stuff, you could end up making a tremendous amount of money. Uh, but now what we see is a very competitive environment, which has produced what we might call a long tail effect. And um, this is actually, I think, a really important, really simple kind of idea that really um, has major effects for a wide variety of things in today's world. And so the long tail is uh, something that we observe on you know, platforms like Spotify in terms of song listenership, in terms of Amazon, when people are buying products, in terms of um, television shows like Netflix, uh, their popularity. Basically, the idea here is that they're, you know, take Netflix's catalog, for example. They will probably get the vast majority of their viewership to watch like three shows at any given time. You know, they'll be watching some uh, shows like Bridgerton or whatever is going to be no top, you know, number one show in the entire Netflix catalog. And you'll have a couple of other ones that are very well liked and frequently watched. Up until very recently, The Office probably was up here in this very high part of the, of the long tail distribution. And, you know, a few other ones that are really, really popular. Uh, and then as you go, you start to diminish in popularity um, as we get, you know, maybe still some hits, but things that are maybe less... Uh, of a broad appeal. So you get your great British baking shows on Netflix, you get who knows what, you know, movies that some people missed in theaters that were okay, um, a few other big properties, um, you know, some kind of X-Men show, whatever, whatever you want. That's probably, that's probably um, on Disney these days, isn't it? And then finally, in this part of the distribution, this, this sort of right part, you've got a huge number of small, um, small sort of uh, uh, content demand shows. And so for each of these shows, we see that as we go, they're almost the same in terms of their demand. And every, every one is demanded very little. Uh, but part of the appeal of a service like Netflix is that it's able to satisfy a lot of 
um, a lot of viewers because it's able to give you some really weird niche content. It's like, oh, here's, you know, some like anime from, from 1990 that like 10 people are really into, but the vast majority of people are not. You know, here's like a show that's just all about, you know, a specific animal. Here's a, here's a show that's just about sea urchins. Like no one really cares about this except for a few super sea urchin fans. And as you go down, you've got this increasingly sort of rare or niche, right? Rarely consumed content that's consumed by a, a group that's very into into that that stuff, right? Um, you can see that in sports too. You know, you've got NFL, you've got NBA, you've got the big the big sporting events, and as you go down, you get the more niche. You know, maybe up in here you've got Formula One, maybe you've got some you know uh, figure skating, you've got golf, and then as you go down, you've got like you know unicycle racing, and you've got beanbag uh, or um, cornhole <laughs> and like other stuff that's on ESPN eight all the way down here in the in the long tail. But the internet creates long tail phenomena constantly. And as a result, um, it's also had that effect on media as well. So the vast sort of uh, uh, growth of online media um, producers and uh, especially, right, sort of semi-professional media producers and, you know, podcasts is a great example of that. I mean, podcasts are maybe the most like long tail phenomenon where you've got everybody seems to have a podcast where they're talking about things and they've got 10 listeners. Um, but those 10 listeners are committed because they're giving... Uh, takes on news that are directed at these very specific groups. So the long tail is a really important phenomenon in new media today, and it means that we've got this this vast expanse of just different voices in the media. However, we can co compare that trend, that trend of the long tail and the proliferation of sources and of different uh, sort of niche niche news producers to the secret, like the hidden um, other side of ownership, which is that actually a lot of legacy media institutions are experiencing what we call concentration of ownership, which is to say, like, this is one example I've got here of local TV, which is, of course, as, as I've just said, one of, if not the most important news producer in America today, despite the existence of all this online content. Um, it turns out that the top five, Sinclair, Gray, Nexstar, Tegna, and Tribune, um, the top five um, sort of owners of local media stations. So we think about like your WJZ, your Fox 45, whatever. Um, actually, these five companies are increasingly owning all of the <laughs> all of the local news affiliates. So you know Sinclair, for example, is a is a, a media conglomerate that's actually based here in Maryland. Um, they tend the ownership of Sinclair tends to espouse very conservative viewpoints. And uh, they now are going to soon own, you know, more than, uh, in fact, at this point, they're well over 208 uh, local TV stations and media markets all across America. In fact, they own one in our, in our um, market. So you may not know, but Fox 45 actually is a Sinclair station. Um, and, and Fox 45's um, sort of media, media production is influenced to some extent by the ownership of that group. Uh, Gray, Nexstar, all these other ones. I mean, Tribune uh, owns many, uh, many, many regional um, uh, stations in, in our area as well. So this is a really big trend, and you can see there's there's mergers as well that that happened um, in in 2017 and and after. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, this idea that both at the, at the level of newspapers, we think about the Tribune Publishing Group, which is buying up newspapers left and right, um, and at the level of this local media, that essentially what looks like an enormous array of choices, this long tail, is in fact actually just a few very large companies that are uh, relying upon economies of scale to make money in a very competitive news environment. So this is a, this is a sort of double, double um, move here. Where we've got, again, the long tail happening on the internet, and yet among legacy media, this, this snapping up of all of these stations under the umbrellas of very large corporations. And so I think the, the implications for these two trends are really important to compare and contrast and understand. Um, another trend that is sort of an ongoing trend is really this idea that public broadcasting in America is not very influential. We talked about this to some extent when we were discussing the different models of the press and the idea that in America we sort of have this libertarian hewing model where we've got a lot less of uh, public intervention in the media market. 
We think about uh, countries like France, like the United Kingdom, uh, other other countries, you know, even Germany, other countries where um, the the public broadcasting is a much more important player in the media market. When we think about all the BBC shows that you're streaming on Netflix. Those were all essentially uh, paid for by the British government for their viewers. Uh, BBC is a, a national um, media service. And so uh, public broadcasting in the United States doesn't have that kind of uh, funding, especially due to the influence, again, of conservative politics over the last several decades. And as a result, instead, our, our uh, you know, NPRs and our um, PBSs and other public options in the United States are reliant upon trusts and foundations, uh, often for funding. And that, you know, I think has a lot of implications for the kinds of content that they produce. And also, I mean, we have to remember that these, these uh, groups are being dwarfed, despite the fact that trusts and foundations are, you know, providing them with, with, with uh, support as they go. They are simply being out, outmoded by inc incredibly powerful and uh, incredibly wealthy corporations whose number one, you know, business right now is news. So this brings us to a number of questions that I think we need to talk about and think about, certainly before you, uh, you know, get to our next Blackboard Collaborate meeting. And the first question that we need to consider, and certainly the reading will have some insight on this as well, is who is it out there that's actually making content? And by content, of course, we can mean many things. And so if we break this down, we could think, first of all, who's actually producing original reporting? That is. Who's actually sending journalists out into the field with notepads or, you know, in many cases with smartphones to interview local people, to figure out what's happening, to get the details from the police about the case, to go to City Hall and ask tough questions of the mayor or the city council? Um, who's actually finding out what's going on? Right? Who's actually sending reporters in the field to do original fact finding? Another question is who's providing commentary and interpretation? Uh, in today's news environment, we've got a very important role for uh, commentary and for journalists to help us interpret what's going on by giving us the backstory, by giving us history, by giving us context. Who's providing the context? And is this maybe group of people uh, larger than maybe the group of people that's doing original reporting? Um, who's reacting to content? Certainly this is an even larger maybe contingent and brings in even more so than these other things, the uh, world of social media. And then also, is this really all that is important in news production today? Are there other forms of content that are nevertheless important for audiences in today's environment? And what is, what is that stuff and who is it that's producing it? And so if we ask ourselves those questions as we're doing this reading, as we're encountering this content, and we're thinking about just the lay of the land, the actual amount of content that's being produced and the number of players in this very crowded media environment, I think that we might end up um, you know, coming to some important conclusions. And so you know, I think that one of the, the first conclusions that we might think about and we might ponder as we're doing this reading is first that social media Often we think about this as an enormous generator of content, but it's really actually uh, a source for content propagation and even, as, as we uh, read some of the reading this week, even pro uh, content curtailment. That is a place where content can actually be, uh, be stifled and cut off. And that's a, an increasingly important debate that needs to be had today about the degree to which social media is in fact you know, allowing for the flow of information or if it's shutting off the flow of information. Um, one thing that we have to remember as we're thinking about this is, of course, again, this idea that legacy media, especially newspapers, nonprofit journalistic um, you know, groups like ProPublica and local TV reporters are actually the top producers of important news content today. Um, and their funding model is essentially directly proportional to the amount of local direct content that we can, we can have. Um, but again, when we go back to social media, we've got to think... About, think very carefully about users and how the democratization, the leveling of the, so, of the playing field, the media playing field with social media might change our, both our definition of content and the amount of content that's produced. And so I think we can have a very interesting and potentially lively debate about whether social media is sort of uh, helping or hurting in some of these, uh, in some of these trends. Um, especially with the Tucker et al. reading, I think it's important to focus on this, this uh, idea that 
uh, social media is becoming uh, more and more a platform in which we're seeing a struggle between sort of pro-democracy forces and anti-democratic factions, both in the you know various countries where we've actually seen protracted crises of democracy, and even in our domestic politics as, as well. And so there's some really important uh, questions to be had about kind of the, the biggest question of the course, which is what does this all mean for the health of democratic linkage? And so as you're reading t uh, t today and as you're reading for the rest of the week, I want you to really think about uh, what we're learning about the state of the fourth estate, that is the state of this independent uh, media institution. Um, what are kind of the biggest trends? If we could do a takeaway of each of these different, um, different media, what are the biggest trends, both politically, uh, economically, what have you, um, in, in all of these different sources? Um, especially when we think about social media, are, are these media networks increasing or decreasing the production of original content and the propagation of original content? Uh, and again, really getting down in all of these uh, answers to the question, what this means for democracy itself. Because as I've posed uh, to you at the beginning of this class, at the end of the day, all of our conversations about the intersection of media and politics in a democratic country have to do with this linkage and whether or not this linkage is strong, whether it's robust, whether it's healthy, or whether there are problems with it that require solutions either from private sector reform or from some other source. And so I hope that this is an interesting set of readings for you. I hope that this really gets you thinking about what's out there simply, really getting a lay of the land of like what is, um, you know, what are media today. And uh, I hope that that uh, certainly is a, a springboard for an interesting and exciting conversation that we will have uh, during our weekly session. I'll see you then.